Hello everyone. In the subject stylistics today we will discuss defamiliarization. Defamiliarization happens or occur due to foregrounding. So in order to make something defamiliarize we foreground it. And foregrounding is achieved through a linguistic technique that is called deviation and parallelism. This lecture is divided into two parts. In part first, we will discuss in detail what is foregrounding and how foregrounding is achieved through deviation. And in part two of this lecture, we will discuss how foregrounding is achieved through parallelism or parallel structure. Let's begin our today's lecture and learn how foregrounding is achieved through a linguistic deviation. Russian formalism and defamiliarization. Stylistics as a linguistic discipline has its root in Russian formalism. So if you want to know about stylistics, you can find the roots of stylistics in a literary movement that is known as Russian formalism, which attempted to isolate the properties and characteristics of literary language in contrast with everyday and non-literary language. So Russian formalism attempted to contrast a literary language from non-literary language and then they attempted to identify what are the features and characteristics of a literary language. So this movement produced a label that is known as defamiliarization. Defamiliarization can occur like in any field or any subject. Defamiliarization can occur in painting, in music, in literary texts, right? In any kind of activities. So something which is already familiarized to the audience, to the reader, to the people. An artist or a writer makes such things defamiliarize in order to make them more prominent or to make them more attractive. So this is called in defamiliarization. For the process that was thought to be at the heart of literary language. So what is the heart of literary language? Defamiliarization. So there were several structures which were already familiarized to people. For example, on the one hand we have a literary language and on the other hand we have a non literary language. So in a non-literary language or everyday life language, we use a normal pattern of language. For example, subject, verb, object. And when we make a question in present tense, so we use does and do in the past tense, we use did. So that is normal pattern of language usage. So a writer and particularly a poet is going to defamiliarize this structure and this defamiliarization occurs through foregrounding. They are going to foreground one of the structure and that would be stained out, right, to make them separate from its surrounding. So this, through this technique, they are going to defamiliarize a structure and this defamiliarization happens through foregrounding. Right? So it is one of the feature of a literary language. It's the heart of literary language because we use metaphor, we use simile, we use personification and we use abnormal pattern of language particularly in poetry. So described by Douth Waite in 2000 as impeding normal processing by showing the world uh, an unusual, unexpected or abnormal manner. So they are going to, the artist and the poets, they are going to show to the people or to present the people something which is already usual. They are going to make them unusual. Something which is already expected, they are going to make them unexpected. Something which is already normal, they are going to make them abnormal. That can be in painting, that can be in drawing, that can be in music, that can be in uh, drama or particularly that can be 
in poultry. So they are going to make things, they are going to make language unusual, unexpected and abnormal to make it more prominent and to attract the readers, the audience, right? Foregrounding was established early on by the pioneers in the application of linguistics to literary analysis as the mechanism by which defamiliarization takes place. So, defamiliarization is based on foregrounding, right? And it is foregrounding which gives a way to defamiliarization. Now, here we have the person Jane Makarwiski. Jane Makarwiski identified the theory of foregrounding. So, what he says about foregrounding, let's discuss. Foregrounding in language was first identified by Jane Makarwiski, 1964, and referred to features of the text, which in some sense stand out from their surrounding. So, those features of a text which stand out from their surrounding. By stand out mean that which are different, which are prominent by their surrounding. So, we will have, for example, we have a whole passage, we have a paragraph and inside a paragraph, one sentence, one word or one phrase, it is foregrounded. So, that one sentence or one phrase or one word which is foregrounded, that is stand out from their surrounding, right? So, the term itself is a metaphorical extension of the concept of foregrounding in a visual art, painting and photography. Essentially, foregrounding theory suggests that in any text, some sound. Now, remember, he is explaining that in any text, some sound. If that is spoken, some sound. If that is written, we also focus. Okay, those sounds in written form. So, in any text, some sounds, some words, some phrases or clauses may be so different from what surrounds them. So, inside a text, some words, some sounds, some phrases, some clauses would be different than, uh, the, than the text in its surrounding. So, those different words, different sounds, different clauses would be called foregrounding. So, or from, uh, or from some perceived norms. So, we have some perceived forms. We have some standard norms for language use. So, those uh, sounds, words and clauses would be different, would violate the standard norms in the language generally. So, that they are set into relief by this difference and made them prominent as a result, right? So, some of the features of a text, for example, sounds, words, phrases, clauses, they would violate the rules and they would stand out from their surrounding in order to make these certain features prominent and uh, they would have some important role. That's why they uh, are made stand out. That's why they are made prominent. That's why they are foregrounded. Right? Now, foregrounding can be achieved through linguistic deviation or linguistic parallelism. Now, in this lecture, we will focus just on linguistic deviation. Furthermore, the foregrounded feature of a text are often seen as both memorable and highly uh, interpretable. So, foregrounded far grounded features of a text, they are memorable. We remember them because there is something important about that. And they are highly interpreted that why such features are foregrounded, why certain letters are foregrounded, why certain sounds are foregrounded, okay? And this foregrounding uh, is made or is happened through what? Through deviation, right? So, they are highly interpreted and they are memorable. Foregrounding is achieved by either linguistic deviation or linguistic parallelism. So, how do we achieve foregrounding in a text, in discourse, right? So, foregrounding is achieved either through linguistic deviation, 
certain structures are deviated okay they are in unusual form they are uncommon form not common one so they are deviated and the standard norms of a language are broken or linguistic parallelism or there might be some uh, parallel structures some certain structures are repeated several time it happens through deviation or linguistic parallelism now let's discuss linguistic deviation the notion of linguistic deviation is another concept arising from the russian formalism so linguistic deviation or the concept of linguistic deviation also arose from russian formalism which was a literary movement and poetry in the genre that most clearly exemplifies this feature so deviation most often occurs or we find in poetry rather than prose fine so thus giving support to the notion that there is a distinct language of literature so the language of literature becomes different how whenever we find deviation or we find that a language is deviant it tells us that the language of literature is different than the language of everyday life situation and how a language becomes different a language becomes different through linguistic deviation and most often we find this deviation in poetry so deviation is essentially the occurrence of unexpected irregularity of lang in language so there might be some certain structures which occur unexpectedly irregularly so first thing is that there will be some unexpected structure of a language and these structures can be some semantic structures uh, syntactic structures phonological structure uh, discourse structure or uh, uh, morphological structure so we will have some unexpected linguistic structures and these structures would happen would come irregularly where in language and results in foregrounding and this would result in foregrounding so foregrounding is achieved through linguistic deviation most often in poetry also in prose but it is frequently found in poetry on the basis that the irregularity is is surprising surprising to the reader and this irregularity will surprise the reader that there is something important okay and certain structures are foregrounded why they are foregrounded because they are made prominent so deviation may occur at any of the levels of linguistic structure so we can have deviation as i told at phonology level syntactic level morphology level semantic level pragmatic level so it can occur at any level and it occurs because it, it is stand out this structure in order to draw the reader and the audience attention something important about that thing right now example of foregrounding here you can see that is example a very good example of foregrounding that a grief a go most often when we use a go so a go is accompanied within uh, like a time we use like an hour we use like a month we use like a week we use like 2 hours 2 weeks 2 months and here it is used a grief ago so a grief and ago they cannot go together right so why the poet has used a grief ago so this is the example of semantic deviation right it is semantic deviation because a grief cannot go with a go in everyday life situation we say that i met him an hour ago or i'll meet you a week i met him a week ago okay most often it is used in past tense ago and uh, i saw him uh, uh, like uh, a month ago so we use a month ago we use an hour ago we use a week ago but here we have a grief ago so that is deviation so a grief ago it's taken from uh, uh, from the poet thomas 2003 let's explain it 
explanation. In example 1, the word grief is semantically deviant as a result of its uh, floating uh, or expectation that a countable noun related to the time will occur in the syntactic frame. Right? So we think that here we should use like a time. Okay? Like as I told our hour ago, a week ago. So they say that accountable uh, noun should be used here and that should be uh, like a show time. So grief being in contrast and uncountable are mass. So what is grief? Grief is uncountable now. A grief ago, there, there is uncountable. Right? A mass are noun of emotion. As a result of this deviation, the title of the poem is foregrounded. So the whole title is foregrounded here. And consequently, we are invited to look for a significance that goes beyond surface level understanding. So we might think that why a grief ago? Why not an hour ago? Why not a month ago? Why not a week ago? Why not a year ago? Why not five years ago? Why a grief ago? Something important. So this is semantic deviation. So one possible interpretation might be to see that poem as uh, encapsulating the all-consuming nature of grief. All-consuming nature of grief. There's something is grief there, a grief ago. Right? So, to the um, extent that the grief in question is so strong that it becomes the measure by which we, uh, we gauge time. So, the grief is that much important that it is replaced with the time, like a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. Which means that the grief is very much strong, it's very much painful. That's why a grief ago is used here. Fine? Now, we can have external and internal deviation, two types of deviation. Example 1 illustrates semantic deviation, though deviation can occur at any linguistic level, although we uh, tend to think of deviation as a variation uh, from normal usage, which is known as external deviation, right? So, it is also possible for deviation to be internal. So, this is the example of you can see internal deviation. Uh, sorry, uh, the example of external deviation because something semantic, it's come outside. So that is the example of external deviation and we can have also for deviation to be internal uh, to the text as opposed to external. So a good example of internal deviation is the poetry of E. E. Cumming. Perhaps the most striking aspect of deviation in much of the Cummings poetry is the use of lowercase letters where we would normally expect capitals. So we expect capital letters and we find uh, like a lowercase letter, right? Or small letters in E coming poem. So then that would be internal deviation. So semantic deviation, that is the example of external deviation. Now we focus on internal deviation. Example from coming poem. Thus, though uh, is typical of Cummings poetry and so it is difficult to attribute any great significance to it other than a general desire to break with normal convention. However, one of the effect of this deviation is to foreground any instances where Cummings does use capitalization such as in the line below. From poem you can see saying it is spring. So you can see that the letter uh, uh, of S that is capitalized where it is expected by the reader to be a small one. So instead of lowercase, a capital letter S is used here in spring. So this is the example of internal deviation, right? Now explanations as a consequence of the internal deviation, we can infer that spring is an important concept in the poem. Since spring is the first word we come across with initial capitalization, the only other capital letters in the poem comes in the final line where the first letter of each word is capital, thereby foregrounding the, 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 the uh, propositional content of the poem's last phrase. Deviation and Poetic Style 
deviation then is a common feature of poetic style it means that deviation is most frequently found in poetry though it is also common in other genre and text type of course the idea that poetry breaks the rule is not a new one in the past also we say that po poets have got a license that is called poetic license and they break the rule it's not a new one but still we can say that deviation most often we find in poetry but the precision offered by stylistics has enabled analysis to to accurately map the specific kind of rule breaking and in, in, innovation to be found in poetry and other text so that is stylistic analysis which enable this deviation more prominent right and we identify that what kind of rules are broken by the poet and why these rules are broken down so this is the importance of stylistic because we see the deviation occur in poetry from the last so many century and stylistic is quite like a new phenomena of the 20th century phenomena end of 20th century and uh, uh, and and then we see that um, uh, and when we do stylistic analysis so we identify that what types of rules are broken and how and why they are broken by uh, the poets and the, the the name that is given to it deviation right now uh in the next lecture we will discuss for grounding through a parallelism and it would be a very interesting lecture uh, we will discuss parallelism parallel structures and uh, uh, level of parallelism so please keep watching and enjoy learning with muhammad imran please don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and provide your valuable comment and feedback in comment section thank you so much